thank you for asking that question. Uh, welcome to Ask Me About Death Building. We are all going to talk about murder and other forms of death. Not I need to remember that there are other forms of death that aren't murder. <laughs> I am your moderator, Sarah Gailey. These are your brilliant panelists, and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves to you, starting on this end. I should do this. Uh, <laughs> I, I normally carry one around that I got off Neil Gaiman. Um, uh, my name's Pat Rothfuss, and I write big fantasy books. Rarely. Um, I'm not getting any mic. Am I? Is it on? Do, is, it, is it any better? than just this? Uh, Let, let's uh, use our microphones in case we have people in the audience who are hard of hearing. And if anyone has trouble hearing any of the panelists, do me a favor and just raise your hand yeah. and we'll try and adjust so that you have access. The problem is I've got teacher voice and I've got dad voice. And, and then if I use those both into the microphone, we all die. Um, Stick anyway. with the murderer voice. No, I forgot. Stay on theme. Anyway, yeah, my name's Pat Rothfuss, and I uh, write fantasy books for the most part. Hello, my name is Monica Valencinelli. Most people know me from my work um, in the gaming industry, but I also do nonfiction and fiction. And with respect to this panel, um, characters in particular dying, I could go either the, uh, as I was mentioning to Sarah just a moment ago, the City of Angels route or the Tucker and Dale versus Evil route. So. Uh, depending upon the tone, and I will definitely take my cue from the other panelists. Hi, I'm Anatoly Belovsky. Uh In real life, uh, I've been a baby doctor for 30 years, but I'm still hoping to grow up someday. Uh, and in fiction, I am a short fiction writer who hopes to grow into a tall fiction writer someday. <laughs> uh, my name is Jonathan Brazy. Uh, I was 34 years in the military, and not surprisingly, most of what I write is military science fiction. So when I kill people, I rather I usually kill them quite violently. Same, but in real life. <laughs> <laughs> so, just for clarification, when you say baby doctor, you're a pediatrician. Oh wow. Okay, I'm, I'm really intimidated now. <laughs> oh. Uh, I also did an elective with the Connecticut State Medical Examiner's Office. <laughs> uh, hence, hence the investigating death building part. This is going to be so much fun. <laughs> uh, to start us off, I would like to ask all of you lovely, brilliant people, what is your favorite death that you've ever written or, uh, <coughs> if you must, read? Oh, it's much too early for that. Um, I, I, I happily got on this panel just because I, um, I, I like to always kind of be the counterbalance. You know, I am not, I, I do not have a really high death count. You know, in in what I write typically, um, or when I when I do gaming, um, I'm a big fan. Of, I mean, death is is pretty easy. Like somebody dying, honestly, it's it's been done and it's been done a super lot. Um, so I'm a big fan of the fate worse than death, or um, because when you you die and it's you reset and then it's over, but the threat of death, like the threat of death, never gets stale. It just gets more and more like oppressive. Um, but in terms of my own, the, the one that I'm, I'm proud of pulling off, because again, I don't have many to choose from, and I mean, spoiler alerts given, um, when I kill off uh, Kvothe's family, traditionally, I mean, because you all, I mean, I have an orphan boy who goes to a school of magic. This has been done before. <laughs> but a lot of times they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Like everyone died. Everyone this person loved died. His family died, or the the you know, or, or you know, the the husband died. And then they're like, let's get past that. There, there's motivation. Now, there's your tragic backstory. Now, let's get into what's going on. And I'm like, I'm like, no, like, I wanna, I wanna 
like get to know these people like like really get to know these people like if i don't break your heart i have really failed at my job and this is a problem working with hollywood now because you're like they're like how about we take your your quarter million page book and we turn it into a, an hour and a half movie and i'm like so that means 3 minutes until the parents die right and and i'm like i'm like you have to like the people it, it should feel like a legitimate surprise i and and that's what i wanted and i was really happy that i did it and i was really happy that my editor gave me the words to like spend chapters and chapters and chapters like you know a novella's length maybe a novelette i bet you i'm i'm 40 50,000 words into the book and we've known his this entire troupe for all this time um before they die and um and i partly did that uh, in lucky guesswork and i partly did that through deliberate choice but then the more i still read and especially the more like i deal with hollywood i'm like wow i really did kind of dodge a very a very well worn path there with that but yeah that's mine i had uh i i agree actually about getting to know people i liked people who do get killed ought deserve not to just be a spear carrier they deserve to be a character and when people tell me they cried i feel like i succeeded but the most interesting death i guess which is actually actually happened someone i know observed it um i don't know if you're all familiar with what a recoilless rifle is but basically think of a of an artillery piece but instead of just the round going over you have a back blast that's just very violent and in one of my books a uh as the good guys as the marines are retreating they leave a kind of a futuristic recoilless rifle and the bad guys come up and the marines have taken off the sights of the rifle so you can't aim it but they think no problem we can just sort of look down the barrel so they bring the rifle around and they're looking down the barrel and they fire it and the back blast of course kills the person who <laughs> is who is firing it but then and this is the part that when i heard this it stuck with me i heard this as i was a midshipman at the naval academy um they were looking at the dead body, and they're going, wow, these tricky Marines, they have a gun that shoots backwards. So they turned the rifle around, oh. put in a new round, looked down the barrel, and fired it again. <laughs> and that is honestly a true story that happened in the Korean War, and it made it into my book because you can never beat true stories. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> When I think of death and characters, I think it depends upon the format of what I'm working in. Uh, if you have a novel, you have more time to develop the interpersonal relationships between the characters and to also show what happens after the characters die. Uh, to name drop George Martin, one of the things that he had mentioned on a panel early on when I first started coming to these conventions was that uh, he talked about how important it was for dust to matter. And, and I tend to agree. Um, when when a character dies it leaves a hole but often that hole is not a period or an exclamation point it needs to be filled in by the people around it and when you have a novel you have more time to do that i like the short story format to experiment with how characters die because sometimes there's um, some mental exercises that you can do in order to make it different or interesting uh, i have a huge background in horror and I was very influenced by more cerebral horror growing up. And one of the stories that I had written, um, there was a voice that was constantly telling the character who was uh, gender neutral. You never knew what gender the character was. I gave very little descriptions so everybody could kind of see themselves in the story. And in the story, the voice kept telling them to dig. And at first they thought it was digging plants out in the garden, out in the backyard, but it wasn't. They ended up digging inside themselves. Um, and the idea that there's these unseen forces that can cause you to do terrible things to yourself, I feel is an aspect of um, 
how death building can be very interesting because we're talking about both internal conflict and external conflict. But in, in horror gives you the ability to play around with some of those tools to explore those fears. You never really forget your first. Uh, so 30 years ago, as I was graduating from med school and uh, uh, Judy Tarr was, grad uh, was uh, getting her PhD at Yale, uh, we were friends, and uh, uh, she needed a near-death experience for uh, her novel, Element, that she was writing at the time. And she needed something that would have been definitely fatal in the 10th century, but could have been cured with 10th century technology or uh, anything, uh, if you knew what to do. And you were allowed to know what to do magically, but you had to heal uh, mundanely. And I gave her a uh, pericardial tamponade, which is... Uh, uh, a penetrating injury of the pericardium, the sac that the heart is sitting in, uh, but not through the heart. So blood would seep into the pericardium and choke off the heart, not allowing it to expand. Uh, and the yeah, and the cure for that is twist the knife that caused the injury and let the blood come out. It's that easy. So that ended up in Alamut as as the injury. The uh, one of the protagonists gets stabbed, and she's dying of pericardial tamponade. And uh, the magical protagonist, just there's a knife stuck in a wound. He twists it, blood comes out, magic, uh, magic cure, but mundanely. So that, that's still one of my absolute favorites. You know, uh, on various, uh, uh, various uh, exchanges, uh, questions come up like, how do you painlessly kill a brain in a jar? Uh, oh, <laughs> turn, turn off the circulation. Uh, how do you... How do you get somebody shot with an arrow through the abdomen uh, without killing them? Uh, well, make make it make the uh, the arrow a uh, wad cutter instead of a barbed, and it could very easily miss everything important. Um, we do stick uh, needles to the abdomen all the time. Uh, that sort of thing. It's it's mostly not building a gruesome death. It's mostly building a uh, miraculous recovery. Uh, under the rules of, uh, of of the game, sometimes you know you get questions like uh, believable magic to heal a wound. Well, how about magical maggots? Uh, that actually worked. For for me, along those lines, something that sorry, something that uh, I I still have in my back pocket, which means I shouldn't. This is this is all copyrighted, by the way. I don't 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 steal don't steal my cool idea before I get an answer. Write it in a book. The uh, um, like dysentery just will will tear through a community and um, and you know especially if it's a place without a lot of real genuine medical knowledge like what do you do and it's like well you just treat the symptoms but the real symptoms it's not just like fluid loss and the fact that you know all of what's going on um, like it's your electrolytes that's what really screw you up um, if you're, if you're, as as one of my friends said, losing it out of every hole for several days, and um, but like, how do you replenish your electrolytes in a medieval or a Renaissance society where you don't have access to Gatorade or Pedialyte, um, and like especially the potassium, which is what's gonna give you like heart arrhythmia and like your whole body gets goofed. Um, uh, potash. I mean, there's a reason they call it potassium. Like you c just like a, a slurry of sugar, salt, and fireplace ash <laughs> is like a potential miracle cure. Which again looks like magic, mm -hmm. you know. And and actually, I, I I pull that in my books a lot, where the people the people who are touted as 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 wizards or whatever. It's just that they have good book learning that doesn't exist in other places, and some of them are also good showmen. And so they're like, eat this, and they're like, you literally pulled that out of my fireplace. And, and they're, like, they're like, oh, the, it's, now it's magical potion. Um, and then they're like, great, now I don't die. Okay, did anybody else think of Oregon Trail when he mentioned dysentery? <laughs> okay, it wasn't just me. <laughs> So I'm curious, everyone has been talking really uh, brilliantly about what's important to you in the deaths that you write and in the, the cures that you write. What are our death-building pet peeves? Oh. Oh. 
Well, I, I wrote a whole uh, post about that once. Uh, you know, things like uh, having a shuriken embedded one centimeter into the forehead and instant death. <laughs> uh, 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 having somebody shot through the shoulder um, and uh, then use that arm to arm wrestle. Uh, <laughs> there's a little thing there called the brachial plexus. Uh, you mess that up, uh, it, it, it doesn't work so well anymore. So I collect old cookbooks, and one of the things mm -hmm. that uh, they used to do, instead of having cookbooks, they, had, they would have household guides. And the person that would be running these households or manners would also be the nurse in addition to the chef and the caretaker and et cetera. And they would have all of this medical advice jammed into these really interesting pages. Um, and one of the things that I learned from reading some of these 18th, 19th century books is just how rapidly our knowledge of medicine changed, but also the vocabulary we use to describe some of it. And uh, my favorite anecdote is how they used to cure drowning. So I want you to know that hanging somebody upside down from a tree, that's the old way. That's bad science, <laughs> okay? The new way, you put the body in salt water and you just kind of let, you have about three hours, three hours, give or take, before that person really dies and then you need to pump the water out of their lungs and to do that, you can go get your fireplace bellows. So, wow. <laughs> Tara. <laughs> wow. But um, I think one of the challenges for modern writers is that the medical knowledge that we had in some of these periods doesn't match our modern understanding, and some of the language and the terms and the, the ideas that they had also don't match what we have. So where my pet peeves come in it, into play is the idiosyncrasies that are so noticeable that the author didn't even try to put it in context. Like I really appreciate it when a writer tries to do some world building around that time period to kind of give us more context. But if you're going to start dropping in 20th century medical terms into an 18th century text, that's where my suspensions of disbelief tends to go away. For me, I think <coughs> it's overestimating or underestimating the effects of weapons. Uh, when somebody, this happens a lot more in TV, but I read it too, where somebody gets shot with a, with a regular round as in as we have today, and they go flying across the room and up against the wall. It, that's just one of the things that bugs me because it just doesn't happen. But on the other side, you have people in a sword fight where they're hacking away and chopping off arms and everything else, and they're still going 45 minutes later, hacking away at each other. I mean, the human body is the human body and can do some amazing things, but try to be a little bit realistic. It's... And actually, long before I was published, um, I was in uh, a writing class and we were doing that occasionally excruciating thing where you all have read everyone's thing and you're all sitting around and talking about it in front of everyone. And somebody had written like a short piece and I think it was set in Vietnam and somebody had been shot and like a part of the, the skull had been blown away and he was talking. And... Um, and, and then somebody said, boy, I just like, you know, I, I know some medicine. My dad's a doctor. He's like, this, this is a great scene, but like, he, this can't happen. Like, it's like, you, if you could feel the back of his head, you know, like being soft, it's like, it just can't happen. And then the guy's like, actually, this really happened to me. And you know, and that's that's the galling thing. And it's it's not just about death or medicine or the human body. It's that some things really happen and they are so unbelievable that you still can't write them. You know, or if 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 you do write them, you have to work so much harder to convince people of something that's true sometimes. Than you ever do, then because you're like, it's like, so guess what, dragons, and everyone's like, I'm in dragons, just do it. And then I'm like, it, my my personal experience, you know, there's some cultures that don't believe in fatherhood, and they're like, you are a fucking idiot. <laughs> and I'm like, literally, this exists today, to say nothing of like, you know, uh, you know, hundreds of years ago, 
but yeah, the, the human body, when you're dealing with these particulars, it is so delicate and it is so fragile. And in other circumstances, it is so unbelievably persistent. One of the uh, foundational cases of uh, neurology and functional neurosurgery and functional neuroanatomy is a case of a man who uh, was uh, tamping down gunpowder gun powder in a barrel with a uh, crowbar. Oh, and uh, the gunpowder ex exploded. The crowbar went straight through his head, That's projecting right. out the other end. He walked to the doctor uh, and uh, said, I have this thing. And when they did uh, you know, neurological tests, such as they were at the time, they realized that the only change in him was he was now a much happier person. <laughs> Where can one get such a crowbar? <laughs> God, we, they would sell like hotcakes these days. Um, uh, my, my peeve, and it's not a peeve, like this is, like I will, I will shout this from a soapbox or a rooftop. Um, if you kill a kid... First off, I'm just going to make a rule for you. If, if you are an aspiring writer, you can't do it. Or a dog. You're not good enough. Oh my God. You are not a good enough writer to kill a kid in a book and have it be acceptable. You can do it, and it will be bad. If you're not a parent, you can't do it. Because, and, and, and this is something, I actually was working with a, a good friend, and they were, they were working on their manuscript, and there's great stuff. And I'm like, oh, this is such a good work. And then they kill a kid. Uh, obviously, and what do you do? You're, they're doing it to establish character. It's like, oh, this group of people. Oh, society is so cruel. Oh, this person is bad. And I'm like, <clears throat> you are a better writer than this. You know, if you default to killing a child or, here's the corollary, even seriously endangering a child to achieve an emotional effect in a book, you're trying to you're trying to program a computer with a hammer which means you are you are bad and you should feel bad because <clears throat> like something that is programmed into us at a cellular level we would not have existed as a species if we weren't designed to protect children and this is even those of us that aren't parents even of those of us that haven't hung out with kids even any of us it's really deep down in the marrow and I see it increasingly. And it's, it's not just bad writing, but it's scary because the more of this we put in our fiction, people experience it in a certain sort of way. Mm -hmm. And then this becomes normalized. And we already have like the death of children being normalized constantly, like with school shootings and with the media and the way news coverage happens. Just let me, please don't be part of this problem. Please don't engage in abuse of your reader. There are better ways to achieve. Now, sometimes, if this is a central aspect to your story, don't do it. This is the equivalent of, uh, does anyone else remember the, the term, you like you fridge a girlfriend? You know, like, it's, it's that. Mm -hmm. You know, similarly, if you're writing a book for kids, don't kill a parent in the fucking first four pages because you're, it's not good for the kids reading it. That's fucking traumatic. Like my little boy reads a book and somebody like, oh no, the dad died. And I'm like, what the fuck did you just do to my kid? I am ang I want to go to your house. He, he, doesn't, he does not need to become accustomed to the thought of his parents dying. He's six years old. So like... That's my pet peeve. Maybe don't. Maybe just, and it's maybe contrary to the nature of this panel, but like, maybe don't kill someone. It's really effective uh, not killing someone. Yeah, there's other ways to get peril or tension. Now again, military sci-fi, different world. There's different genre expectations, but who boy. Um, and I say this as somebody 
who killed off everyone that's important to my main character. But, but that's literally central to the story. That is the purpose of the first half of that book. But just don't. Just, like, be so careful. If it's anything regarding a kid, there's, there's probably a better way to get where you're going. This brings us actually perfectly to my next question. So thank you for doing the segue for me. What are our other responsibilities to the readers and the characters when we're writing death? If you as a writer have not experienced what it's like to lose someone either close to you or peripherally, please talk to somebody who has. Um, I feel that a writer's responsibility is to tell the truth. Sometimes it's our truth. But if you haven't experienced what that's like, it can be incredibly traumatizing. There is a range of emotions that happens with death, and it also depends upon the person. Death is complicated. It is not simple. Um, say that a character has a parent who was a jerk or abusive. What happens when that abusive parent dies has a number of different effects on that character. And it's not always easy. There's this thing called grief relief. I don't know if you've heard about it. Um, I've never heard that term, but I think I've experienced it. <laughs> um, grief relief is when somebody who is a terrible human being dies and you are, instead of feeling an emotion of uh, grief, you suddenly feel like this weight is lifted off your shoulders and you are incredibly relieved and then you go through this complex series of emotions where you feel guilty because you're like, but wait a minute, this person died. Should I be feeling sadness over this? But I'm actually really relieved. What is this? Um, so when you're thinking about character death, and I would argue that who not to kill is also part of death building, maybe think about it in context of what you're trying to communicate about the relationship between that character and the other characters around them. One thing I, I <coughs> excuse me, if, you, if you've never been in combat and you've never been in the threat of being killed or having to kill somebody else, it's difficult to understand the emotions that go through you. And when you actually take a human life, not, you know, I'm not talking about the, a criminal element who may be thinking a different thing, but when you're in combat, and we're, we're taught in our society, thou shalt not kill. And when you kill somebody, you have a horror, you have sorrow, but you also have excitement and thrill because your adrenaline is going. And so when I write my books, I mean, I have a, one of my most popular characters is a, um, is a sniper. How do you feel the first time that you look down a scope and you reach out 200 meters and you take a life? How does it affect you? So when I'm writing and I have someone who orders, who orders a bombardment of a planet that kills a, a, a tremendous amount of civilians but who knows that it's, in, it's going to save more lives further on, I like to explore how people might react people who have killed somebody, what goes through their mind? How does that affect them later? How does it affect later decisions that come up down the line? So for me, I, I focus a lot on how it affects the person who's actually killed another human being. Yeah, I think uh, basically just respect the death. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a big thing, don't throw it away. Uh, Use it where you absolutely need it, uh, as little as possible. Uh, don't use it as a simple explanation for a character's uh, for a character's uh, actions. Uh, explore it and explore and uh, respect the dead person. Give them a life. Give them a character. Use as much character building skills on someone who's not even on stage anymore as uh, as you would on somebody who is. Just that basic measure of respect. Something that, that I don't think I did, I got a little riled before when I was talking, um, that I don't think I, I, I communicated well. If you're not a parent, and I don't want to draw a line between like there's those of us that have had kids and there's those of us that haven't. We're different species or something. 
But I remember watching Battlestar Galactica. Uh, I, I already watched a big chunk of it, and I'm like, this is so good, and I want to share it with my girlfriend. And so she, she's like, okay, great, a, a cool thing. Let's watch it. And we sit down to watch it, and she grew up with eight siblings. She now, like, <laughs> maybe it's more. Maybe it's changed since I got on a plane. She has 25 nieces and nephews. There's, this is a huge family, very baby-centric. And we were watching, um, effectively, the lead-up to the real Battlestar Galactica, and the woman in red shows up, and she's talking to this woman, like, before everything goes bad. She's on Earth. She's talking to this woman about this baby. And I, I remembered what happened, and I'm like, and, I, and I, I kind of like panicked sitting on the couch next to my girlfriend because, you know, she has always had like zero tolerance policy in her media for violence against children, which I viewed as sort of like, oh, she's very sensitive. This is not something for her. But so this is going on. And what happens is there's the implied, and, and this is, this really demonstrates like some of the weirdness that happens in storytelling because, again, spoiler alert, the Cylons kill, like, most of humanity. Uh, but you don't feel weird about that because it's all off screen, you know? And it's like, well, okay, that's, that's the price of admission for the story we're going to get now. That's the orbitable, orbital bombardment. But she's down there, and she's like, and she talks about this kid. And then sort of like, you know, the woman looks away and she goes down and obviously what's implied is this this character kills this child there's no noise there's no motion there's no nothing then she walks away and then you kind of distantly hear the mother screaming in the background and sarah looked at me she turned to me and her face and she goes i'm done she was so angry. She was angry at that show, and she was angry at me for suggesting that we watch this together. She was livid. And at that point, and I was like, and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I go, I go, that was so heavy-handed. That's not what this show is about. And here's the thing. It absolutely did not matter to her. And it was four years until I, you know, when everyone was talking about it more as the new seasons came out that she was willing to re-engage with it. So what I'm saying, it's, it's not that if you haven't had kids, you don't get it or you can't get it or whatever. I'm saying that if you imperil a child, you are dealing with some primal forces that if you mishandle them even a little bit, you will lose your reader. Um, and, and maybe not like, like their trust or maybe like they'll be disappointed or they might write you a letter. Like they will put down your book and never ever engage with your product again. They will go and write you an angry letter. They will, they will, they will hate you. They will hate you on a deep and visceral level sometimes. I, and, and some people don't get that. I used to think, I'm like, I get it, kids. Kids are the best. Then I had kids and I'm like, oh no. Oh no, I really didn't get it before until I was a parent. And I like to think that I had a fair amount of empathy before, but oh no, not until you have that kid and you watch him sleep, do you know actually how to be afraid? Um, so again, I just, I can't, I can't pound that nail hard enough. It's just such an avoidable mistake. Just really consider real hard before you, you do something like that to a kid. Well, I would like to open us up to questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and repeat questions back into the microphone to make sure that everyone in the audience can hear them. And let's keep it to questions. And if you have additional comments or things that you'd like to share later, you can find us all out in the world. Okay, so the question is, how far will adrenaline take you if you're severely injured? Uh, how much can you actually do with adrenaline? Yeah, uh, a lot. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
no, seriously, I was in a very stressful situation once on one of the tiny little islands in the uh, Bermuda uh, Basin, uh, and uh, I ran up a rocky hill barefoot. Now, this was a higher hill than, than I've ever run up before. Uh, I'm a real tenderfoot, so running on jagged rocks w in bare feet was not an option before. In fact, it was uh, not an option walking on a rocky beach before. And I ran up that hill very quickly and felt no pain whatsoever, uh, things I have never done before. Uh, I, I think I'll uh, yield to adrenaline in combat. <coughs> adrenaline, <coughs> excuse me. Adrenaline in combat can keep you going uh, and make you do things like, like he said that you, you can't imagine you would ever do before. Uh, w there are so many cases. If you if you read a few of the Medal of Honor citations, <coughs> Victoria Cross citations, people have been shot. 15 times and they're still continuing to fight until the fight is over in which case they die so I mean these people are mortally wounded they are not there's no way they're going to survive yet they are able not only to function but uh, function at a very high level and that is pretty much strictly adrenaline and the, and the desire and need to continue to save your your fellow Marines your fellow soldiers to lift the car off off your child and you hear all this stuff. Adrenaline does amazing things to the body that bodies just can't normally do. Um, just to, and, and adrenaline's part of this, but shock, um, which I don't know, like is there a technical term for shock other than shock? Shock is the, the mm. medical. It is the medical term. Um, shock is a hell of a drug. Um, cause like I was once injured like a whole lot, um, uh, like felt no pain, um, and, uh, lost an amount of blood. Uh, like when you go in and they test like, like how workable your blood is, there's that 20 point scale. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was at like a three and a half and 20 is like full, like all the blood. Um, you know, like this, th that's, it's doing, doing good. 20 is good. I had like a three and a half, which meant it was pretty much like Kool-Aid. Um, but like I could talk, like I was cognizant and rational and like making jokes and like giving uh, direction advice to the ambulance driver. Um, um, like shock there, there's a reason it's built into our system it's that it's an amazingly biologically adaptive thing um but again super unrealistic in a lot of cases the degree to which shock can carry you through some of these things uh, i was in the emergency room once and they brought a guy in two ambulances and the part that had the head talked <laughs> Fuck, that's a way better story <laughs> Was that person just, named Pat just Rockfuss? The, just, <laughs> just the two ambulances. You had me at two ambulances. Yeah, I love the two. I just, I love the st setting of that two ambulances. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, uh, well. uh, I think so. Yeah, but uh, they weren't able to reattach the part. No, seriously, this was a motorcyclist who who sideswiped a median. And his leg stayed uh, attached to the upright, uh, and the rest of him in the motorcycle kept going. Alrighty then. <laughs> hmm. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the funny thing is that that is a little bit more Tucker and Dale versus Evil than City of Angels. So, um, uh, motorcycle advice: if you wear the helmet, then the head part will still talk. <laughs> More questions, please. Um, I would like to offer, too, that one of the things that we haven't touched on yet is funer... funer ugh, I can't say the word. You got this. Yes, that word, customs, um, and also the fact that there's a growing feminist movement to reclaim the body after death. 
Sarah Chavez and Lindsay Fitzgerald are two people doing incredible work in that field. So uh, we haven't talked what happens after the death. So those are also really good questions to ask us. Uh, the question is, what do we mean when we say reclaim the body after death? So in life, we have biases, right? And a lot of I know, it's shocking. <laughs> Um, and a lot of times our religious practices and how we deal with people's human bodies, even in medicine, and this is something that you could speak to as well, um, unfortunately falls under sometimes gender lines or even more serious biases and bigotry than that. And there's a growing feminist movement to have um, death be a more positive experience both honoring the person as they were in life, but also the people around them to remind them who that person is. And uh, I, I personally am very drawn to it because I feel that death is a natural part of the cycle of life. And it's something that as we continue to have d conversations about decolonization, which Sarah can speak to, um, and a lot of the other feminist movement aspects, uh, it's, it's just a part of that conversation. But it's something that doesn't get talked about because death is very uncomfortable for a lot of people in real life, even though we kind of channel how we deal with it in fiction. No, great question, a great answer. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Goodness. Um, do we have other additional thoughts about funerary rites, which is <coughs> an important part of writing death responsibly? Mm. Not really. Uh, well, not a yeah to an extent. Uh, w one of the big things in my books is how people react to losing comrades, and we have hero ceremonies and things like that, and uh, they play an important part in in many of my books, and it's how people react after losing somebody important to them. Um, and because that's part of our society. We do have all these different funerary rites from back from Neanderthal time, Neanderthal times. You know, we see what they do, what they've done, and it goes through all the way. Why wouldn't it? You know, I write mostly future fiction. Well, those things are going to be important in the future too. So I think it's very important to discuss that. If you're going to kill people, don't. It doesn't just end right there. There's consequences and reactions and it affects other people as they go forward. Um, <clears throat> um, it, just to touch on, on what she said before about like the aftermath, you know, there's no, no matter what you write or how realistic or appropriate it is or possible it is for a character, there's such a variety of human experience that if you only show one facet of it, you can't help but kind of misrepresent it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and, and again, uh, all of this should be in service to, to the story. Because if you're not working toward, for the story, you have left the path of wisdom. Um, that's what we're that's what we're doing here whether it be a game or a movie or, or a short fiction or long fiction it's all about the story and if you forget that you, you cannot win nevertheless there are, are important but secondary things like accurate portrayal of the human condition realistic responsible ethical portrayal of the complexity of truth and to do that I think the best way is to show multiple ways of dealing with it um, because people will deal like the, the loss of a comrade or grief of, for a parent or, uh, or, or these things. You can't, there's no right way to write it, um, but if you show multiple people experiencing multiple things, First off, it's more realistic. Second off, it's more rich in terms of its story. Third off, it'll save you from a lot of angry response from your readers because more people will see their experience there. But also, and this is the most important thing, 
it won't seem like you're proselytizing the validity of one particular experience over others. Like my favorite go-to is I have like three people argue about something in a bar and they're all pretty legitimately right in their opinions and they don't necessarily come to a conclusion at the end. It's just they, they all feel different things about something. They all argue. They all kind of get to say their piece. They all make interesting, different, conflicting points. And then we move on. And the, the gist of it is, huh, well, I guess that that's a little tricky, isn't it? You know? And then, I, and then I'm like, and at the end, three and a half months is how long you grieve your mother's death, period, the end. Okay, chapter eight. You know? And there's none of that. I just try to show that there's a bunch of different ways of doing it. And I think it's, it's not only safer, but it's, it's a little more responsible storytelling. Um, I'd like to build off of that if I could just very briefly. I don't want to monopolize the panel. Um, the first thing is, is that there are a lot of rituals surrounding how we grieve someone. And some of that is not only to honor the person, but also to show who that person was in place of a society, whether that's a microculture or a larger culture. And faith intersects in that. I can't stress enough that what a person believes should absolutely be a part of this process whether that's something very spiritual or religious in nature or patriotic or et cetera, you're, you're getting down to the root of what the person is. Um, the other thing is that there is a tendency, and it's unfortunate, but if you are at a funeral sometime, and I've been to, unfortunately, too many, but sometimes what happens is that there's this emphasis on what people should be doing at a funeral. That's the reason to have these multiple perspectives, because you as the writer are giving permission for the reader to feel what they feel and legitimize those feelings. Because in a story, the point of telling a story is to make it so emotionally compelling that you're taking that reader along by the hand. And when you're writing about death, instead of using the hammer analogy, I like to think of a fluttering bird. You are carrying a fluttering bird in your hands because you're telling the reader that here, I am very sorry I hurt you, but by the way, because, right, because dealing with the death, by the way, I am very sorry that I hurt you, here's how that pain is manifesting for these other characters, and I understand how you feel. So by showing these different perspectives, you're not only exploring grief, you're also giving permission for the reader to feel, and I feel personally that that draws me into the story more frequently than, oh, you know what? We're just gonna go ahead and throw an arrow through somebody's heart and then just dump them off a cliff and that's it. We just never see the end of them because we had to get rid of that character. We had no idea how else to do it. Um, so when I think of it, I, I also think of you know things like faith and belief, flowers, oh my gosh, like mm. what plants they use, what decorations they use, all of these things can have really powerful symbiology, but also tie into things like food. Um, there's so much potential for great world building that can go beyond just the death itself that you can highlight a lot of layers of the aspect of the culture too. You know, and I, I don't feel good on a panel if I don't contradict at least one person. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna contradict myself what I said earlier. Sometimes, you don't want it to be too real. Again, in service to the story. Um, and the, a great example of this is Star Trek. Um, I read an article where somebody mentioned that like the old Star Trek couldn't do what it did if it tried to be more realistic. Because these people all know each other, they're all on a spaceship, and sometimes like a couple of them just go to a planet and die, like on the reg. And if you dealt with the emotional impact of that in a realistic way, by like the sixth episode, everyone would be just a hot mess. And they couldn't fucking like, like, like hang out with the, the green people and like learn a weird heavy handed moral lesson, you know? <laughs> and so in those instances, I don't feel that what they've what they that they handled death badly i feel like in that genre those deaths were yeah i bet if you if i went back and looked and i'm like you know you could have you, you didn't need to kill that person that was lazy storytelling but you know also 
to make it the most dark, gritty, realistic, psychologically traumatizing thing also isn't always the right choice. It's it, depending on the story. Um, it, it all depends on the story. And sometimes that means you do gloss over it. But, but then I'll say, I'm going to contradict my contradiction now. Fight, fight, fight. If, if you... Uh, if you're if you're suddenly if you're suddenly glazing over a death that you put in your book, maybe you didn't need it in the in the first place. So. Uh, denial is definitely an emotion that people deal with in death, and it happens all the time. Um, I, I, I think that the issue of, uh, I think that the issue of how we treat death on a massive scale is very frustrating because if you look at how the news reports death, when we have one person dying, we go into their life story, their grandmother's pets, hairdresser's dog, etc. Um, but if a whole bunch of people die, we don't physically know how to cope with that because we're not there to see the devastation. We don't understand what this means. So people that experience death more often or have been through those tragedies, um, they can get triggered. They can also experience PTSD from that, uh, which is another emotion that I think we should <laughs> definitely touch upon. Um, but some people become so emotionally numb to it just because the scope is just so far outside of their human understanding. So denial, I think, is definitely a legitimate feeling. All I'll add about the PTSD is I've been surprised. I, I have characters with PTSD, I mean, because it's a logical part of combat. But how many people write me afterwards, uh, not leaving reviews, not doing anything else, but writing me and expressing to me, how that affected them, what they're t how they're dealing with it, how they're reading the books to help get past their PTSD. But I, I get I get a huge amount of, of emails from people who suffer from PTSD and telling me how they're dealing with it. They they send me, you know, two, three thousand words of, of in an email on what they're doing in their life to try to get past it. So I think PTSD is something that we tend to ignore as we're writing, especially some of us, you know, I see Terry Mixon back there and other people who write with big numbers of people dying. Um, I think we kind of ignore that a lot. You, uh, the, the truth is you just can't get it. I don't, I don't know if there is anyone who like, when, when that whole Syrian refugee crisis got real big on the news, like like thousands of people were dying and had been dying and had been in the news and everyone knew, but then there was the picture of that kid. Yeah. And then suddenly it's like, it's real, real. But like imagine being able to feel that for a thousand people. Yeah. I heard somebody argue once that like this is, why we don't have to fear legitimate machine intelligence because like if a machine can ever like actually emotionally engage in things in a meaningful way they will immediately short out because they don't have human fail safes because like imagine like how you felt when you heard of, when you saw that picture of that kid and then it's like planetary bombardment and the your ai just dies your AI just deletes itself because it can't deal with that times a million. Um, and I and like I just don't think there's a way for us emotionally to engage in death on that scale realistically. So for anyone who didn't hear, the question was, what was wrong with us in the early 90s that we kept killing the best friend? Nirvana. <laughs> I think that does it pretty well. Yep. 
<laughs> yeah. Advice on what not to do when we're killing a major character. Yeah. Well, I think it's uh, it's fair to say that if you're going to do that, the the old uh, Greek tragedy principle of having them, uh, in a way, brought down by uh, their their own uh, character uh, sides of their character that. Uh, their major strength and their greatest weakness are two sides of the same uh, feature of their character uh, would work really well, I think. Um, I guess my question is where this, where, where is your story focus? Because if you kill off the main character, you have the potential to lose the readers if they're connected to that character. Um, so make sure that you have a lot of characters if you're going to do that, because if it's... Uh, if you're writing a romance, I'm going to contradict myself. You're infectious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if you're Joss Whedon, um, if you're <laughs> if you're in a, a situation where you have a romance and you're going to kill off one or the other, first of all, please stop killing the female love interests yeah. as a means of giving the male hero some chance of revenge or vengeance. Been there, done that. So tired. Um, it, the Sometimes you lose the reader because they're connected to that particular character. The solution then is to have more compelling characters uh, because if you have more characters for them to pick from, then they don't kind of lose that narrative thread. I, I almost made a big, big mistake. I had an eight book series and from the very beginning, the main character was gonna die in the last book and that was going to uh, bring everyone else together to defeat the evil empire thing. And as I got to the eighth book and I'm writing it, I started having second thoughts. And I wrote to my email list and I said, hey, uh, I got a question. This is a spoiler alert, so if, if you answer here, you know, I'm gonna tell you what's gonna happen. And so I had like 78 people email me and say, yeah, yeah, tell me, tell me, tell me. <laughs> and I said, I said, okay, I'm going to kill off Rick. And this is why he has to die, because he's done, he actually killed 20,000 people uh, you know, in the in the war, and he had to go. And uh, 75 people said, no, don't. Th <laughs> three people said, um, if you have to. And that was the best move. I know people, a lot of people say, never, you know, you're the artist, you control it, you write what you want. This was the best move I did. So what I ended up doing, he had to leave the scene because of what had happened throughout his career, but he faked his death to be taken out of uh, out of the scene and, and humanity can go forward. Of course, a lot of the people who had at, who knew this when he when his spaceship blows up, they were saying, "Son of a gun, he did it." <laughs> but then the very last scene is the be the very la the epilogue is the best thing I've ever written because he showed it. Part of I like ceremonies in my books, and part of the ceremony is the last two people of a of a class of officers who are left alive share a, a, a bottle of port. And he shows up to share that bottle of port, 43. I actually get a little, it's crazy, you have to read it, I guess. But I had, <laughs> but I had people, people, say, people say that this is the first time they've cried when he comes back to share the bottle of port. But I, so I had to take him out. If I had done it, it would have been a mistake. Mm -hmm. I would have had a lot of people who are vested in this universe that would have been really upset. So it was the smartest thing I ever did was to ask my readers, should I actually kill him? All right, uh, we actually are, uh, we have about one minute left and then they're going to make us all flee this room. Um, final comments and is there anything that you would like these very nice people in the audience to read of yours or look for from you coming up? No, don't read read the Last Unicorn by Peter S. Beagle, um, <laughs> or read um, 
if you can get a hold of a copy, the innkeeper's song or like the, the rhinoceros who quoted Nietzsche, if you want like a more of a bite sized taste of what he's capable of. If you have not read Peter Beagle, don't bother reading my stuff. Read his first. I don't know how to follow up to that because like anything I do is going to be just like self-important. So be self-important. Uh, wow. That was, that was super classy, Pat. Okay. Um, oh, read sorry. I, that's not, <laughs> that's very off brand for me. <laughs> I just really like Peter Beagle. <laughs> Read Pat Roth. <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I will go down the line. Like, no, really, do, do it. Do your thing. Um, you can find out more about my work at booksofm.com, but uh, I would encourage you, if you have any questions, a lot of us are going to be here at the show, please take advantage of the fact that we have a medical doctor on the panel. That's so awesome. Like, I write because I do not have the brain for science, so I just walk around doing this to scientists all the time. Well, Monica, that was off-brand, too. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, we have uh, an officer uh, on deck. Well, I'll be a little self-serving. You, uh, <laughs> you could find me at jonathanbrazy.com, but if I, I somehow I was lucky enough to get to be a finalist with my novelette, they're in the, I actually printed them out. Uh, they're in the bookstore, so if you actually want to read one of them, it, you don't have to pay for a whole book or whatever. But I've got the weaponized math is over there in the in the bookstore here. All right. Well, uh, we have got to release the room. Thank you very much, our brilliant panelists. Thank you, audience. Thank you. you guys did great. <laughs> <laughs>